Uh, my name is David Bowes, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Institute. We're glad to see so many of you here. Um, I expect that we're going to have more people coming in, but uh, it looks like they'll mostly go to the back because we're full down here, so they won't be too much uh, of a disruption. Tomorrow, as I'm sure you all know, is Juneteenth, which makes it a very appropriate time to be talking about uh, the relationship between race and state, or perhaps more specifically, between the United States government and its African American citizens. Um, race is a particularly interesting topic for us to talk about here because it's always uh, in the United States presented a challenge to advocates of limited government. It is the oldest and largest blemish on America's commitment to freedom and opportunity. The cause of federalism, we, we think that federalism is an important limit on federal power. The separation of powers, the division of powers within the federal government, and the division of powers between the federal government, the states, and the communities. But federalism got caught in the discussion of states' rights, of slavery, of Jim Crow, and to a great many people, the cause of federalism was tarnished. It was perceived as something that white Southerners were using as a protection for inimical attitudes and practices, and that is uh, and, and that, I think, has had real negative consequences for the structure of federalism in the United States ever since. So I think you're going to find that uh, Judge Napolitano's new book, Dred Scott's Revenge, is a fresh and provocative look at these issues, in particular a look at the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, and how they have been applied or not applied to questions relating to race in the United States. Many years ago, when I was a young conservative and the scales had not yet fallen from my eyes and I still regarded myself as a conservative, um, I used to read National Review and I kept reading about this distinguished thinker that they kept talking about named Dean Mannion. And it took me years to find out whether Dean was his name or his title. And I did eventually find out that his name was Clarence Mannion. He was the dean at some point of the Notre Dame Law School. I suspect there are a lot of people who know of Judge Napolitano and are not absolutely sure if he has a first name. Uh, <laughs> so I want to tell you that his name is Andrew. Uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano graduated from Princeton University and also from Notre Dame Law School in the years after Dean Mannion's tenure there. He became the youngest life tenured judge in New Jersey history. Uh, for 11 years, he was also an adjunct professor at Seton Hall uh, Law School, where he taught constitutional law and jurisprudence. And, of course, he is best known as the senior judicial analyst on the Fox News Channel for the past decade or so. He can be found at various points on the uh, Fox schedule and the Fox Business Channel schedule. You sometimes see him uh, hosting Fox and Friends, appearing on The O'Reilly Factor, um, sometimes other shows. He also hosts a daily radio show, uh, Brian and the Judge, and he is heard... Uh, regularly or, or seen regularly also on his Freedom Watch, uh, which is broadcast over the web every Wednesday at 2 p.m. as part of Fox's Strategy Room programming. His previous books include Constitutional Chaos, A Nation of Sheep, and The Constitution in Exile, which was a book that was very well received by Jeff Rosen of the New Republic, who has been desperate to prove that someone on what he perceives as the right, actually uses the phrase, the Constitution in exile. Uh, so uh, he finally has a book to wave around. And you've got to be intrigued by a book that has drawn praise from Juan Williams, Nat Hentoff, and Glenn Beck. Um, let me go ahead and uh, mention our other speakers before I invite uh, Judge Napolitano up to the uh, podium. I first noticed Damon Root's articles in Reason Magazine on such topics as Thomas Jefferson and race, the progressives and race, Franklin Roosevelt and race, uh, Frederick Douglass, and 
I guess race goes without saying there, uh, the Jeffersonian uh, who founded the NAACP and judicial protection of individual rights. And I thought this is a remarkable young writer who I don't yet know. And unfortunately, uh, Reason's editors were more on the ball than I was, and they hired him. And he is now an editor at Reason and writes very frequently for both the magazine and the website. And our other speaker, our other commenter today will be Jason Kuznicki, my colleague here. He's the research fellow at the Cato Institute. He's also managing editor of our online magazine, Cato Unbound. He holds a PhD in history from Johns Hopkins, and he's recently completed a major research paper on racial discrimination and the state. So with that out of the way, let me welcome to the podium Judge Andrew Napolitano. Thank you, David, and thank you for explaining what my first name has been an obstacle all these years. I think that uh, I was on the bench probably about a week when they assign you small claims. You know, you walk out into a courtroom, there's about this many people in the courtroom, you have about five minutes for each case. The cases go like this. Uh, the dry cleaner ruined my blouse, but he also tried to pick up my sister. So a lawyer comes up to me and he says, uh, Your Honor, I, I have a client that doesn't speak any English. We need a translator. We need a tr the Italian translator in the courthouse. I call the administrator's office and the translator is busy in another courtroom. So I say to the throngs, is there anybody in this room that can speak Italian? Little guy in the back raises his hand, he comes up. We swear in this translator to tell the truth. We administer the oath to the witness and here's exactly literally what happens. Lawyer to translator, give the court your name. Translator to witness, what is a your name? <laughs> it's, all right. Let me see where this is gonna go. <laughs> Lawyer to translator, tell the court your address. Translator to witness, where is a your house? <laughs> I looked at this guy, I said, I thought you told me that you could speak Italian. He said, I can't hear one, but my English, she said, not as so good. <laughs> one time I was picking a jury in New Jersey, as in the federal system, and as in many states, the judge actually picks the jury. And again, you're confronted with a crowd about this size, and you have to extract 12 people who have no bias, no interest in the outcome, no prejudice about the defendant or the state, uh, and no knowledge of the facts in the case. So you begin to ask questions to wheedle the group down. And I say to the crowd, is there anybody here that can't serve on this case? It was a criminal case. The allegations, the indictment against the defendant was drug distribution. Little woman in the back raised her hand and she says, I can't be on this case because of my occupation. Well, I thought to myself, what could she possibly do? I said, all right, madam, what do you do? She said, I'm a soothsayer. Oh, who the heck? calls themselves a soothsayer in 1995. So I fall for this. I said, okay, how does that keep you from being on this jury? She said, judge, I already know how the case ends up. <laughs> I should have said, tell us and save us the next three weeks in the courtroom. So from, from a ridiculous trial, these two that I'm telling you about, to one of the most serious in the history of the world, uh, in which the defendant is presenting his own defense to the jury. And he says this, you'll know these words from the play and from the movie, but they are literally extracted from the trial. Some men say the earth is flat, and some men say it is round. But if it is flat, can the parliament's laws make it round? And if it is round, can the king's command flatten it? It was, of course, Thomas Moore arguing in his trial for high treason, the alleged and, by their standards, proven acts of treason, where his refusal to assent to the king being head of the church on earth. He was appealing, of course, not only to the common sense of his jury, but also to their understanding of the natural law. Of course the parliament can't change the shape of the earth. And of course the king can't do so either, even though they both behaved as if they could. We fast forward a couple of hundred years, and Jefferson, uh, notwithstanding his 
uh, personal behavior, my hero amongst American presidents, because he believed that the individual was greater than the state, and the state is greater than than the federal government. Jefferson argues in the Declaration of Independence, you know these words, every school child does, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He weds to the American soul the natural law, the same argument that Thomas More was making, that our rights come from our humanity as a gift from God. Jefferson rejects, though the Constitution in some parts accepts, the idea of positivism, which is what all the big government types in both parties believe today. They believe that our rights come from the government, not from our humanity, and that the same government that grants our rights can ungrant them. They even believe that, uh, that our rights can be taken away from us by an, a, a law of the Congress or an edict of the president, like you're an enemy combatant, and therefore all your rights are taken away from you. Well, this, of course, directly rejects the Thomas More understanding, which is the Thomas Aquinas understanding of, of rights passed from the creator, who's perfectly free, through his creatures, who are perfectly free. Obviously, we are perfectly free. Look at the abuse of free will every day. This is such a great gift from God. He uses, a, he, per, he permits us to use it with utter freedom, to abuse it in the most horrific ways. But we only have it because it is His gift. So, with that as a as a premise, and if you if you know my thoughts and my work, and if you have seen my previous books, you know that I hold myself out as an unabashed champion of the natural law, and I've argued in, in almost every forum that will hear me, that will have me that it is a natural restraint on all government, I decided uh, to write this book. I mean, we live in an era in which the natural law is utterly disregarded. It is, it, it is trashed by government as much as the Constitution itself is. So Dred Scott is a metaphor. This book is not about Dred Scott, though there is a chapter about his case because it is so fascinating. Dred Scott is a metaphor for a government a, a series of governments, state governments and the federal government, that notwithstanding the lofty words of the Declaration of Independence and notwithstanding some efforts to incorporate those ideas into the Constitution via the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, uh, a government that would think it could write any law, enact uh, any policy, and enforce any program, notwithstanding its utter rejection of the natural law. So, how could the same generation that wrote all men are created equal possibly have enforced slavery? I, I can't answer that in this book, but I want to stir the pot about it. The book starts with the slave trade and ends with the election of Barack Obama as president. And it uses the Dred Scott case, as I said, as a prism through which to examine uh, what governments would do, like one of the first laws that George Washington, the father of our country, signed was the Fugitive Slave Act, which made it made made you immune from a state kidnapping law if you, in a northern state, kidnapped a runaway slave and forced that person back to his owner. Uh, interesting, the debate going on today about state nullification. Montana is attempting to nullify certain federal firearms regulations. In, in 1834, the legislature of Massachusetts purported to nullify the fugitive slave law and said to law enforcement personnel in Massachusetts, if anybody kidnaps a fugitive slave in Massachusetts, you are to prosecute them for kidnapping because we don't recognize the fugitive slave law. Nevertheless, it was signed into law by the father of our country, who, when the capital of the country was in Philadelphia and the legislature of Pennsylvania outlawed slavery, they put a clause in the statute saying all slaves in the state of Pennsylvania must be freed within six months of their entry into the state. So what do you think George and Martha did with the slaves from Mount Vernon? They rotated them through every five and a half months so that the president and his retinue and his wife in Philadelphia could have all the slaves they wanted servicing them 
uh, without being in technical violation, though obviously being in violation of the spirit uh, of the Pennsylvania statute. Um, I make a lot of enemies when I tell people that I think that the worst president in American history and the one with least fidelity to the Constitution was Abraham Lincoln. And I make a lot of enemies when I say that. I haven't made the enemies amongst the people that signed the paychecks at Fox yet. So I do keep saying these things. And I, I make the arguments uh, in here uh, about uh, Lincoln's true purpose in the, uh, in the Civil War. It was not to free the slaves. If you read both portions of the Emancipation Proclamation, you must read the second portion, which probably was not described to you by your public school teachers, in which the so-called great emancipator specifically authorized the institution of slavery in four border states, in the city of New Orleans and in the six parishes surrounding New Orleans. The Dred Scott case is, is a lesson for us today because of the manner in which uh, the Supreme Court addressed this. It's, it's a, if, if you're a lawyer, it's a tortuous and fascinating procedural history. But to break it down to its essentials, Dred Scott is born as a slave in Virginia and after a series of masters, finds himself in Illinois where he sues for his freedom. The case eventually makes its way to Missouri in the era of the Missouri Compromise and eventually the case makes its way to the Supreme Court of the United States. Now in those days, the Supreme Court did not issue opinions the way it does today. That is, they didn't sit around a table and decide, all right, five to four, six to three, seven to two. Each justice wrote his own, there were no female justices, of course, in those days, each justice wrote his own opinion. And whatever the vote was after they saw each other's opinion, that's what it was. In this case, we have Roger Brooke Tawney, who is the former attorney general of, uh, of the state of Maryland, uh, and who's an adversary, a political adversary of Lincoln, much like, if you would, uh, Chief Justice John Marshall and his first cousin with whom he never spoke, Thomas Jefferson. They were political adversaries. So Roger Brooke Tawney, thinking that he can forestall the Civil War, could have written, once a slave, always a slave, because slaves were deemed property in half the country, or once set free, always set free, because he was at one point in his life, set free. Instead, the Chief Justice uh, comes down with an opinion that is the worst of all possible uh, resolutions of this, and as we know from what happened five years later, it didn't resolve anything, and that is, we can't hear your case, Mr. Scott, because you're not a person. Because under the Constitution, you're not a person, and only persons can bring matters uh, into the federal court system. Now, you may say, well, that happened in the 1850s. It's not going to happen in our lifetimes. It happened in 1973, January 22nd, 1973, when the Supreme Court issued, I don't know which is the worst case, but it's among these two. It's either Dred Scott or Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade, which articulated that babies in the womb are not persons, and so no one can sue in their behalf, and they can be slaughtered up to the moment of birth. My own home state of New Jersey uh, permits abortion up to the moment of birth, and if you can't afford it, the state will pay for you. They claim that that's in the New Jersey Constitution. Now, I took an oath to uphold the New Jersey Constitution. I've read it many times. I assure you it's not there. But these are examples, historic and modern, of government thinking that it can do away with the natural law, that it can suspend the free will of a class of human beings, whether it is blacks, up to the time of the civil rights revolution in the 60s. I mean, in many respects, Jim Crow is just another form of, of slavery, and the Supreme Court spawned that with Plessy versus Ferguson. Yes, you can separate uh, the races, as long as you treat them equally. The equal treatment, obviously, was a farce, and it didn't begin to unravel until Brown versus Board of Education. I'll make a little confession to you. When I was in law school and college and even as a young lawyer, I, I thought and argued that Brown versus Board of Education was unconstitutional because the issue of education is not cognizable by, by the federal system. 
until I began studying a little deeper Aquinas and Jefferson and the notion of, of the natural law. The government can't treat people differently on the basis of the color of their skin. And judges in this country must use the natural law to eradicate racism or any behavior that violates the natural law from the armament of the government. Just as George W. Bush can't say to Jose Padilla, you have no rights just because I declare you to be an enemy combatant, thereby violating a host of Mr. Padilla's natural rights, George Washington can't say to African Americans, you may be kidnapped if you escape by whites just because you are politically impotent and just because a majority in the Congress says so. When Jeremiah Wright, you remember him, the, the president listened to those uh, sermons for a number of years. When those sermons were being played and played over and over again in the, in the media, uh, a little, little over a year ago, and it looked like Senator Obama was going to lose the race for the nomination, I began to get letters and emails and a lot of callers on the radio from uh, sincere African Americans who were saying to me, you know, some of the stuff he is saying is a metaphor. He may be saying the U.S. government caused AIDS and gave it to black men, but judge Take a look at the Tuskegee experiment, about which there is a chapter in my book, in which the United States Public Health Service in 1932 persuaded hundreds, hundreds of black men to come under the care of the Public Health Service and that it would cure them of syphilis. It gave them syphilis. It did not cure them of anything. It monitored their bodily functions as they slowly and painfully wasted away from a disease that your government and mine gave to them and lied to the world about. It would take, of all people, Richard Nixon in 1972, who couldn't believe that he had been vice president for eight years and president for four years before he knew that the health service was doing this, to put an absolute stop to it. So sometimes uh, we, we need, no, all the time we need to watch the government. It's one of the reasons that Cato came into existence. It's one of the reasons that so many of us uh, risk comfort uh, to defend freedom. Any government that thinks that it can suspend the free will of a class of human beings because of the color of their skin or their age or their political unpopularity, or the declaration of one person, the president. Any government that is strong enough to do that and can get away with it is a government that is dangerous indeed, and a government that we need to be careful when monitoring. Unfortunately, the positivists and the collectivists and the big government types rule the day and have consistently at least since the era of FDR, maybe since the era of Woodrow Wilson, perhaps since the era of Abraham Lincoln. At my alma mater, Princeton, Woodrow Wilson is revered. He was the president of Princeton and then the governor of New Jersey and then the president of the United States, who, whose grand ideas about making the world safe for democracy were picked up in a perverse way years later by George Bush. Woodrow Wilson segregated the federal government. The federal government and the military were integrated until this uh, president from Virginia, born in Virginia, educated, raised, spent his professional uh, life in New Jersey, uh, decided that people had to be separated uh, by, by race. Even FDR didn't have the courage to segregate, to desegregate the federal government and the military. Harry Truman did it with the stroke of a pen. I couldn't believe that it hadn't been done before that. I'm not a fan of Harry Truman, but I say this to you to indicate the ease with which certain old shibboleths and, and traditions can be swept away when it is clear from the prism of our present lives that those old traditions violate the natural law. So where are we today? We have a biracial president, objectively a very good thing. I don't see a black man when I criticize his uh, activity on the economy and other things that he has done. I see an articulate, handsome, intelligent 
liberal who's doing what he said he would do for the most part and capture the imagination of the public. I see someone who maybe, maybe can help us enter a, bi- a-, a post-racial part of our history. Unfortunately, his respect for the Constitution is just as bad, maybe even worse, uh, than his predecessors. The obligation of contract, forget about it. The sanctity of private uh, property, it's history. The uh, ability of people to pool their investments and make them prudently as they wish without having to get the government's permission, about to be gone. Who's going to monitor this? The Federal Reserve. Look, the job of the CIA is to steal and to keep secrets. We know more about the CIA than we do the Federal Reserve. And that's the, the great super secret bank that he wants to give the power to regulate virtually any human activity in the United States, which in the opinion of the Federal Reserve, should it fail, would affect liquidity. Now they can define fail, affect, and liquidity however they want. What's the point of all this? A disregard for your natural right to contract. A disregard, an utter disregard to due process. Madison wrote, the government shall not take life, liberty, or property without due process. That means a trial. That doesn't mean a statute or a, an executive order. It means a trial. Don't hold your breath. Jefferson. Jefferson's a stumbling block, especially for people like I, who uh, loved and love many of the things he wrote and did uh, and said. Jefferson introduced legislation when he was the governor of Virginia, this is hard to believe, to abolish slavery in Virginia. It didn't pass. Some have argued he introduced it so he could sort of get credit for introducing it because he knew it would never pass, uh, but it didn't pass. Jefferson, as the president of the United States, signed the law pursuant to the Constitution uh, invalidating uh, the slave trade. Jefferson wrote words that would later be condemned by the pro-slavery crowd in the South. They would blame him for getting the ball rolling with all men are created equal. But at the time he wrote those words, he had over 200 slaves, with one of whom there is now ample evidence to conclude. He lived in an intimate relationship for 40 years and fathered seven children. Well, that's not why the pro-slavery crowd a generation later would blast him because he had sex with a black woman and, and she lived with him as his mistress in Paris, in Philadelphia, and in the White House, which he designed, but because he wrote that all men are, great, are created equal. He also wrote, when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. And when we defend the natural law, and when we insist the government stay within the footprint of the Constitution, the government will be afraid of us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to me today. Thank you, Judge. I might just notice, for those of you who are intrigued by his comment about uh, the secrecy at the Federal Reserve, Uh, Congressman Ron Paul will be speaking here next week, also with two knowledgeable critics, and so we should have a lively discussion of whether there should be more transparency and more congressional oversight of the Federal Reserve. And with that, let me welcome uh, Damon Root from Reason Magazine for some comments. Thank you, uh, David, for the warm uh, introduction earlier. Um, Thank you, everyone, to Cato for having me here today. Thank you to the judge for your remarks, but also uh, for the book. Um, I'd like to begin with two quotes, one of which I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with and maybe not the uh, second. So first um, dates January 27, 1843, where uh, in a resolution by the American Anti-Slavery Society, William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist, denounces the US Constitution. He calls it, quote, a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. Now, the second quote, fast forward a few years to uh, 1852, Frederick Douglass, also a great abolitionist. Frederick Douglass had escaped former slave, self-taught author, editor, um, and uh, leading abolitionist orator. And Frederick Douglass, he's speaking in Rochester, New York, before the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. And he says, take the Constitution according to its plain reading. 
I defy the presentation of a single pro-slavery clause in it. In fact, he goes on, interpreted as it ought to be interpreted, the Constitution is a glorious liberty document. So, who's right? Is the Constitution an uh, agreement with hell, or is it a, co is a glorious liberty document? Is the Constitution sanctioned slavery, or does it forbid slavery? Now, these questions don't appear directly in the judge's book, but I think that they really get at the heart of Dred Scott's revenge and the heart of what he's, he's talking about. So that's why I wanted to begin with those. Um, now, this is a very interesting book, and it's very surprising. So let me just run through uh, some of the interesting parts, and then I'll, and I'll go into why I think it's surprising, actually. Now, the subtitle is A Legal History of Race and Freedom in America. So we get a sweeping historical narrative, as the judge says, begins with the origins of the Atlantic slave trade, the, the, uh, the bringing of slaves to the New World through the founding of the American uh, government, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, up to uh, the election of Barack Obama. Um, there's also a chapter on baseball, which you didn't mention. Um, chapter on baseball about Jackie Robinson's entry into Major League Baseball, and this is a this is a great story, and it's told extremely well. Um, and it's and I and, and I have to say, it's actually one of the few really uh, positive stories in the book. Generally, this book is actually fairly shocking. It's a little horrifying. It's disturbing. That's not your fault. I mean, that's the government's fault, right? Um, I mean, that's and that's your argument. I mean, your quote is that the real culprit through our racial history has been the government. That the government on every level federal, state, and local, has permitted, aided, and abetted just the worst forms of racism and uh, racial collectivism. So we're talking about slavery, lynching, and then the, uh, the violation of fundamental individual rights, private property, the right to keep and bear arms, go down the list. The government has violated these throughout, throughout American history. And, and, and I think the book does a very good job of, of detailing that and, and justifying that. So if you, if you encounter folks on... Um, maybe in the left-hand side of the aisle, who say, oh, no, it's the free market. The judge pre presents the evidence that this is, this is the government is behind these things. So as I said, it's, it's very interesting. There's a lot to chew on. If you're interested in American history, this is, this is a great book. Um, now, one, another thing that's, that he does is draws on his, uh, his experience as a Superior Court judge in New Jersey to talk about how this, this shameful racism is, is very much still with us. So it's, and it permeates our legal system even, even today. And he draws examples from, from, the, from the war on drugs as well as from the, uh, the prosecution and executions in death penalty cases, that there is just a shameful racial imbalance going on there. So this is not just the founding. This is not just Jefferson, as you say. This is, I mean, this is through to the present day. Um, and this is very much still with us. And I think that's a very important point. Um, but I also said it was a surprising book. So let me go into why I think it was surprising. Um, I feel like this book doesn't give the written Constitution its, its full due. And I'm, I'm frankly, I'm very surprised to say that. Um, I'm surprised to be here saying that to, to uh, the judge of all people. Remember, his first uh, book is called Constitutional Chaos, What Happens When the Government Violates Its Own Laws. He follows that up with the Constitution in Exile, as David mentioned, how the federal government has seized power by rewriting the supreme law of the land. Anyone who's watched him on uh, Fox News, listened to his radio show, knows that he is a... Uh, a stickler for constitutional law. He recently suggested that uh, President, uh, former President Bush, might be a felon for uh, a, for for proving torture. I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure the Fox viewers uh, really enjoyed hearing that. Maybe you could in the in the Q and A, you could share some of the uh, the the, re, the, uh, list, the viewer response you uh, it's received. More Fox management that I'm worried about. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a little bit of the context for why I'm surprised. Um, but, but I still am. I'm not sure that the, that the book gives the, the, the written Constitution its, its full due. And, and that goes back to these two quotes I opened with. So is the Constitution in agreement with hell, or is it a glorious liberty document? Um, and, I, and I think, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that, the, that Dred Scott's revenge comes down more on the Garrisonian side than, the, uh, than Frederick Douglass's side. Um, and, and, and let me bring that up not as, but really just as a question. You know, and that's, I'm kind of throwing out the first question of the Q&A period here with that. Um, but I also think this is where the judge's views on natural law really come into play. Um, what he says is that in those instances where the laws of the land, and that includes the Constitution, violate the natural law, judges have a duty to disobey. They have a duty to disobey the law. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm with you that when a, a, a federal law, a state law, a local law violates the Constitution, the judges should be activists and they should overturn those laws, they should strike them down and obey the Constitution. But I am concerned about encouraging judges to, 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 to disobey, and your word actually is uh, sidestep. They should sidestep the written law in order to, afford, uh, to enforce the natural law, and I'm concerned about 
allowing uh, judges, encouraging judges to sidestep the Constitution. Because um, what's to stop a judge, say, from sidestepping the Constitution to enforce uh, social justice? or rather than enforcing uh, natural law, enforce Mother Nature's law, some sort of environmental uh, worldview, something like that. So that's a, that's a concern I have. But, um, but I should say, I mean, I'm with you. Let me, let me as the president says, let me be clear. I am, I am with you. I am, Please be clearer. Let me be clear. I am, I'm with you on the natural law. I think the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are steeped in natural rights. John Locke has written all over these documents. And I, and I think that's Frederick Douglass's point. Um, and so that's what I mean by by the, uh, the, the coming down on the Douglas side or the, Jeff or the Garrisonian side. Um, I'd also like to suggest that uh, it's not necessary to sidestep the Constitution to fight for equal rights. As Douglas said during slavery, it wasn't necessary. He said that the Constitution was the abolitionist's greatest weapon against the slaveholders. And he used it in that way repeatedly over and over again. He said that just because we've uh, strayed away from the principles of the founding in practice doesn't mean we should abandon the founding documents, that, that they're ours. They're on the side of liberty, and they're on the side of freedom. And I think that that's, I think that that's right. Um, he said, look to the Constitution and, quote, it will be found to contain principles and purposes entirely hostile to the existence of slavery. Um, so now let me, let me, let me uh, give a second uh, surprise I found with the book, which was I would have liked to hear more about private property and economic liberty. Because I don't think you can, I, I think American racism can only be understood if you also understand that part of it was a, a fundamental just assault by the government on economic liberty and on private property. Obviously slavery, you know, man cannot own property in man. That was an abolitionist tenet. So there you go. That's a violation of natural law of natural rights, the right to own property in yourself. That's in a in John Locke, but also if we talk about the Jim Crow era. What Jim Crow is, is a fundamental assault on economic liberty. So let's take, and the judge mentioned this, Plessy, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, the most uh, famous case. This is the symbol of Jim Crow. And so here you have a Louisiana law that tells the railroads you cannot sell a uh, first class ticket to black passengers. And the Supreme Court says, yeah, that's, that's correct, 1896. And this is where you get separate but equal. So what is this? You cannot sell a ticket to this person, and you can't buy a ticket from that person who wants to sell it to you. That is a fundamental violation of economic liberty, and, that's, and that is the symbol of Jim Crow. So I think that that's a, that's, for those of us, I, I mean, I'm a libertarian. I think many people in the room here are libertarians or believe in free market principles, various forms. I think that's something that, that needs to be repeated and needs to always be remembered, that that's at the heart of Jim Crow is this assault on economic liberty. Um, and, and what you have after that is just this orgy of whites-only laws, of restrictions on um, who can go into restaurants, who can go to beaches, movie theaters, et cetera. Um, now, no doubt, many of those businesses would have mistreated or even excluded black customers, whatever the law says. However, in a market free of Jim Crow regulations, you would have had other businesses running to attract those customers and attract, more importantly, those dollars, those black dollars. And that's a way that the market undermines state-sanctioned uh, discrimination. So I'm with Frederick Douglass. Interpreted as it ought to be interpreted, the Constitution is a glorious liberty document. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a chapter on baseball. And, and, and I said that's, yeah, that, I think that story is told very well. It's a, it's a great part of the book. Um, and it's an, as I said, it's an uplifting story, and it's one of the few uplifting stories. I mean, this is a, this is a shameful part of American history, and it's not, it's not pretty. You know, what you're, what you're reading about is not, is not pretty. It's important to know, but it's not, um, it's not what you'd call a beach read, maybe. Um, so in closing, I'd like to tell another uh, positive story. Now, this one isn't in the book, but I think it could be. I think it's in the spirit of Dred Scott's Revenge. Um, so this is 1917. The, uh, the NAACP, the National Association of Advancement of Colored People, which is just a few years old at this point, wins its first major victory before the Supreme Court. It's a case called Buchanan versus Warley. And uh, the NAACP wins this case by arguing on behalf of property rights and on behalf of economic liberty. Now, the issue was a Jim Crow law that restricted uh, residential housing. So blacks could not live on majority white blocks, and whites could not live on majority black blocks. So the, uh, the NAACP brings suit, makes it to the Supreme Court. Moorfield Story, who you alluded to in your uh, remarks, who is the president of the NAACP, he's one of the founders. Now, he's a great libertarian hero. This is a guy who believed in free trade, the gold standard. He was a founder of the NAACP. He was also a founder of the Anti-Imperialist League. So Story argues before the court that by 
telling a black property owner you can't do what you want with your own property, that destroys property rights and violates the Constitution. The Supreme Court agrees. They strike down this ordinance. Now, here's what one leading legal scholar said about that decision. He said, though it was not used to fulfill its to its full potential, Buchanan almost certainly prevented governments from passing far harsher segregation laws and prevented residential segregation laws from being the leading edge of broader anti-Negro measures. So I, I would say that that is Dred Scott's revenge. That's the Constitution in action. That is Frederick Douglass's vision of a colorblind Constitution of a glorious liberty document. And so I think that's a little bit of in the spirit of, of the books. So I wanted to bring that up. But mostly, I think this is a very interesting book. I'd encourage you all to read it. There is a, there's a lot of stuff, as the judge says, that you, know, you didn't learn in public school that you're going to learn in this book. And I think that that's, that's very important. So thank you, and thank you again. Thanks to all of you for uh, listening. Thank you, Damon. And our second commenter will be my colleague from Cato, Jason Kuznicki. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by saying, uh, Judge Napolitano, I, I actually enjoyed this book. And I, I know that it does deal with a, a uh, depressing and at times very disturbing subject. Uh, but you know, I, I have a background as a historian. How did you like that biography of Adolf Hitler? It was wonderful. It was really, you know, you can say these things as a historian. Uh, uh, you can because because you're supposed to you're supposed to be able to you know take a little bit of a, a, a step back from the material and to think about it critically and and in that vein I'm going to ask some questions of you and I I hope to uh, provoke some discussion uh, but I want you to understand that they are from a deeply sympathetic place and uh, that I in general thought that this was really an excellent book. Uh, it's an important book. It's an important book because it blends or, or merges together two stories that are important in American history that are not often talked about together or are not often written about together. The first is the story of race relations in America, and the second is the story of individual natural rights. Now, there are a lot of books about race in America, but I found frequently in reading them that they do not have much sensitivity to the idea that rights are individual and natural. There is very often a concern for group rights or group responsibilities or group identities. Not so much is there an appreciation for and a defense of the idea that rights are individual. And on the other side, uh, there are a lot of books about individual rights, but their treatment of race tends to be superficial or uh, dismissive, uh, you know, why is this even important, or why should we care about this? Uh, and I find those also problematic. This book looks at both of them, and that's what I think is very valuable about it. And because it looks at both of them, uh, it does some very surprising things, uh, like the material on Lincoln, which I think will surprise a lot of people. Now, if you read, if you read pretty deeply in libertarian literature, you will find tons and tons of, of uh, material critical of Lincoln. Some of it good, some of it not as good. Uh, if you really, really want a strong and principled and thought-provoking uh, argument for why Lincoln was not all he's cracked up to be, it's here. It's in this book. This is, this is uh, exhibit A, I would say, in the case against Abraham Lincoln. Uh, also, FDR and uh, the New Deal, and uh, there, are, there are a lot of things that we are told are uniformly good in our public school educations that we should maybe take a second and more critical look at. And uh, one of the books that I was reminded of continually uh, while reading Dred Scott's Revenge it was a book by Ira Katznelson. It's called uh, When Affirmative Action Was White. And uh, Katz Nelson makes the argument that uh, many of the programs of the New Deal, the social welfare legislation that was passed under Franklin Roosevelt, uh, was, you know, many of these programs were in fact profoundly biased against African Americans, either by explicit design or through uh, frank inattention to uh, the social realities on the ground. So for example, for example, uh, Social Security, as it was first conceived, did not apply to domestic help and did not apply to farm workers. 
Now, these were occupations in which the vast majority of African Americans still worked. And everyone in the South knew this. And that's why Southern senators supported what would otherwise perhaps have been a, a uh, objectionable piece of legislation to them. They knew that this would basically be welfare for whites and not for blacks. Similarly, the uh, Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, uh, gave subsidized loans to uh, people who wanted to be first-time home buyers. And you know, if, if we're going to say that, that you know, there's a libertarian case against welfare, yes, of course there is. Uh, but this is, this is uh, I would say, a fairly benign form of welfare in that at that time and in that place, uh, housing wealth turned out to be a fantastic investment. Not so much today, but it certainly was at the time. And uh, very soon after, uh, these subsidized loans were made available. Uh, housing wealth was, in fact, the largest single source of wealth for the typical American uh, anywhere in the country. However, however, uh, it was extraordinarily difficult for blacks to get loans to buy houses in FHA-approved neighborhoods. Extraordinarily hard. And this is where the uh, term redlining comes from. There were, in fact, maps of approved neighborhoods and neighborhoods that would not be approved for these subsidized loans. And uh, they were segregated. This was, this was, in fact, welfare for white people, not for black people. And uh, this is not something that you are likely to encounter in a typical public high school education. Uh, you're, not, you're not likely to see this. Uh, you may hear about redlining. Uh, you're likely to hear that it happens in the private sector. In fact, the research on redlining in the private sector uh, is fairly skeptical that it even exists at all, or if it does, it's, it's maybe under the table, or half-hearted, or here or there, or isolated. It's nothing like what happened in the FHA, where there were actual, literal, red lines on the map. This neighborhood is for white people. It's a very different thing. So, so what we had in, in the New Deal was, in a sense, affirmative action for white people. And that was Katz Nelson's point. And this leads me to uh, my first big question for you, uh, Judge Napolitano. Uh, Katz Nelson takes this in a very interesting direction. He says, because there was this affirmative action for white people, and because it was so recent, and because uh, many of these people are still alive, or their children are still alive, and they were economically disadvantaged, this is in his estimation, a strong argument in favor of affirmative action for black people. And uh, what should we do, if not affirmative action, to rectify these economic inequalities that were based on race, that are still patterned racially, that uh, were caused by the government itself? What do we do about that? Well, it's impossible to eradicate uh, all of them dollar for dollar in terms of the people uh, who suffered. Uh, I have not read Katz Nelson's work. I'm familiar with the, with the thesis of it. I understand, as you've explained so nicely, uh, redlining, and I understand the, the way in which FDR got the Southern uh, senators to vote in favor of uh, Social Security, probably, as you say, so nicely, not something you learned uh, in the public schools. Uh, but, I, but just as... It is uh, a violation of the natural law uh, for the government to have two sets of laws, one for whites, one for blacks. It's a violation of natural rights for the government to recognize color in any respect. Uh, and so it is, a, it is basically the command that the government be colorblind that uh, eliminates it from favoring or disfavoring, whether it's to uh, redress a, a crass, well-known, and horrific historic uh, evil or whether it's to try and give somebody a boost who, who didn't have it because of the way the government treated their parents. It would be impossible for the government to do that fairly, equitably, and economically uh, today. And I, I take literally at least a half dozen Supreme Court opinions arguing for the proposition that the government may not consider uh, race in its armament whatsoever when it makes decisions. Okay, now that's about that's that's about what I expected that you might 
might have as a response, but I thought is it that was, a good is that a good response or not? <laughs> no, I think it's actually pretty good. I think it's I think it's pretty good. I, like the prof- I wanted to bring this up because I think the that professor it, says that's the answer I expected well, from no, you. I mean, it's, it's an important <laughs> second move after after the initial move, which has I think been made in in your book, and and I think it's something that that naturally suggests itself, and I I, and I wanted to to hear what your thoughts were there. Uh, my my second question is a bit more philosophical uh, on. Uh, in particular, on page 139 and 140 of the book, but also also throughout, you write things like this. You write, one nation under God, indivisible. The very phrase suggests a belief in natural law that has validity everywhere. The natural law is rarely mentioned because it is universally understood that certain truths are natural and are not debatable. Among these truths is the fact that skin color is irrelevant to natural rights and personal dignity. Uh, all right, so we have, we have natural rights that are... Irru- are, are uh, not debatable. They are universal. They exist everywhere. And, and then on page 40 and on to 41, you write, throughout the 19th century, American courts would repeatedly put the judicial stamp of approval on the institution of slavery. Facially, these cases place the judiciary in the realm of fault for perpetuating the horrors that the Constitutional Convention mandated. However, despite slavery's patent incompatibility with natural law, is it the role of the courts to sidestep the positive law of the land when natural law is violated? Your answer is yes. And, and your answer is yes in all capital letters. Yes. OK. Uh, how do we recognize natural law when we encounter it? That's, that's my question. And I ask this question for a number of reasons. First, uh, there have been philosophers of great uh, mental ability, great probity, who have believed in the existence of natural slaves. Aristotle and Plato uh, both uh, discuss this possibility and both at times seem to agree with it. Now, now Plato is a bit, a bit debatable. He has some, some dialogues of his where he suggests that people, in fact, are all equal and others uh, where he suggests that p- some people are natural slaves. And, and this has led Karl Popper to speculate that Plato was, was actually two different people or that he had uh, two different phases of his life that he went through, that you know, he changed his mind very radically, or, or maybe these texts are not exactly his. reflective of, yeah, of, of what he believed. Uh, but, but anyway, there's this idea out there that there are such a thing as a, uh, as a natural slave. And, and so, so this is a claim about natural law. How, how do we dismiss claims like that? Uh, and, and I'll give another example. Uh, suppose that I were a judge in 1872, and a defendant comes before me, and her crime is that she voted in an election. Now, this actually happened. This is, this is the story of Susan B. Anthony. And she says, I am just as much a human being as a man is. And if you're going to give voting to men, then you should also give it to women. Now, this, to my mind, is also a claim about natural rights. It seems to me that she has a very obvious natural rights case and that she is correct. Now, by your reasoning, should the judge in her case have found that, yes, she had a right to vote and that, uh, that the Constitution and the positive law should have been disregarded in that case? It's great questions, brilliant, brilliant, sharp questions that, of course, we could talk about for a long time. And, and I would guess, as an outset, that if uh, Augustine and Aquinas and Jefferson were in the room with us, even they couldn't agree as to exactly what the natural law is. That's the difficulty with the natural law, and it's the attractiveness of positivism. Positivism, in, in positivism, the law is written down. Women cannot vote, or didn't say it that way, only property-owning males who have reached their 21st birthday may, vert, may vote. It's, it's crystal clear. So that is a problem that I concede with the natural law, is that not everyone knows it, not everyone understands it, and even those who do uh, will disagree on what it means. But the essence of it is that you sort of know it when you feel it. The natural yearnings that all of us have for certain expressive liberties, for the right to be left alone, for privacy, for freedom from unwarranted restraint, for being treated equally by the government. We all know that these are natural rights because they stem from our humanity because we we all, except those who are deranged, seek them. Can you put your hand on clearly what is and what is not the natural law and get everybody to agree, no. 
Is there a natural law argument for slavery? It was made. I reject it. The more modern natural law theorists from Aquinas on up uh, profoundly uh, condemned it, but I'm aware of what uh, Plato and Aristotle said. Okay, well, uh, obviously the best situation... Is that the answer you expected? Well, I, um, <laughs> it's actually it's a very good setup for my third question. Uh, obviously, obviously, we want a situation in which the natural law and the positive law coincide. That way, we don't have to get to these you know, sort of messy difficulties uh, with disregarding the, the positive law and how uncomfortable that makes us all feel. So we want that uh, to be the case. Uh, I would suggest to you that uh, following the 14th Amendment, in fact, it was the case uh, as regards uh, many of the things that you talk about in your sections on, on Jim Crow. Uh, and it is curious to me that you are relatively silent about one aspect of the 14th Amendment, which is the Privileges or Immunities Clause. And uh, I, I would suggest that this could have been a vehicle for uh, doing away with a lot of Jim Crow, if not all of it. And, uh, and so we did have positive law as well as natural law on the side of treating everyone equally uh, without regard to race, and yet it was not employed. And I would ask your thoughts on that. I, I agree with you uh, on that. I mean, the Privileges and Immunities Clause has been twisted uh, and perverted uh, by the courts so as to permit uh, Jim Crow by arguing that the Privileges and Immunities Clause only applies to the privileges of, of national citizenship, which doesn't include the right to buy a train ticket and the right to go uh, into a restaurant and the right to sit at a, uh, at a lunch counter. I don't think that's what the 14th Amendment meant. It hasn't been interpreted in the modern era that way, but for 75 years uh, it had been. In my view, it's a defect in the Supreme Court jurisprudence, and it, it visited and facilitated Jim Crow. Look, the only reason we had Jim Crow is not because legislatures enacted it. It was a law in Louisiana, as was so articulately pointed out, that you couldn't sell that first-class ticket to a black person, even if they wanted to buy it. It was the courts that permitted this to happen, because they were enforcing the positivist law, the written down law, irrespective of whose natural rights it violated. And I have never hesitated, and when I was on the bench and did this, I did get reversed a lot, to excoriate judges for embracing the natural law, no matter what the written down law said. That's what judges are supposed to do. That's the whole reason we have an independent judiciary, to be anti-democratic, to prevent the majority from taking the, the life, liberty, or property of an unpopular minority. Well, I, I don't want to make this too much of an interrogation, so I, I think I'll, I'll close with uh, an anecdote, uh, which is uh, one of the most striking ones to me about the, the way in which Jim Crow actually was an imposition by state governments. A uh, historian by the name of Jennifer Morse uh, has written about, about exactly this and how uh, the segregated train cars that became such a symbol of Jim Crow were in fact legislated creations and the streetcar companies hated them and they, uh, the customers hated them. And the reason that they hated them is because prior to these laws, the cars were segregated into smoking and non-smoking sections. And having to have a smoking car and a non-smoking car and a black car and a white car meant a lot of empty cars. And it was inefficient and confusing. And uh, the customers didn't know where to sit. Well, I want to smoke, but I'm white. Do I sit with the blacks? But then I'm not supposed to. And I, I don't want to smoke, but I'm black. And I don't want to be around these people who are smoking. And, and, and it caused all kinds of problems. And in the end, they had to get rid of a voluntary system of separating people into smoking and non-smoking preferences, which wasn't in the law, but was voluntarily enacted by the streetcar companies themselves in favor of this legislatively imposed racial segregation that at the time no one wanted. So, uh, so yes, these are, these are uh, you know, I, the, the stories could be multiplied, but that's one that I think really illustrates very well the way in which uh, these, these uh, policies that are so emblematic of Jim Crow actually were uh, fundamentally and originally imposed by the government. They were not uh, the preferences of, of many of the people at the time.
Thank you, Jason. I invite you to join the discussion now. Raise your hand, and we will uh, bring a question. Uh, we'll, we'll bring a microphone around to you. Um, let me start. Um, bring a microphone right down here, and then we'll take one here. And meanwhile, Judge, I'll start you with the first question from Damon Root. Is the Constitution a covenant with hell or a glorious liberty document? It's a, it's a glorious liberty document with obviously some defects in it. The slave importation clause and the three-fifths clause, the, the most, no, the most uh, notable uh, defects uh, in it. But it, it is, for the first time in the history of the world, the inverse of the way liberty came about. In, in the old world, when people struggled and fought for liberty against kings and tyrants, it was power giving liberty. It was those who, by virtue of inheritance or force, reluctantly, who had power, reluctantly parting with some of it to allow liberty. In the American system, from the time Jefferson wrote, all men are created equal. And with the checks and balances with the states creating the Constitution, it was the opposite of power giving liberty. It was liberty giving power. It was individuals giving liberty to the states, and it was states giving liberty to the central uh, government. For that simple inversion of history alone, not only am I with, uh, with Garrison, uh, excuse me, not only am I with Frederick Douglass on this, but I would argue it's the greatest document for the preservation of human liberty <clears throat> ever written in the Western world. All right, thank you. All right, we'll take questions now. Let me just remind you that this is a period for questions, not for speeches or further discussion. Question. Uh, as Judge Napolitano, I heard the great talk you gave here in 2004 about constitutional chaos, and uh, this one's even more interesting because for five weeks in 1964, I was an office assistant to the lawyer in Jackson, Mississippi, who coordinated all the legal activities, uh, civil rights legal activities in the state. Um, since then, we made a lot of progress on civil rights for minorities, uh, women, even gays. There's one area where I think we've gone way backwards, and that's the fact that there are now more than uh, 10 times as many people in jail for drug crimes as there were in the 60s. I see a lot of parallels between the two movements. I just wonder if you might. Well, I never uh, thought of them as parallel movements. My, my own views are not, are not hidden on this, and that is that I'm for the absolute legalization of the personal use and possession of, uh, of recreational drugs for a, a whole host of reasons, the essence of which is freedom of choice and the right to do to your body and with your body uh, whatever you want. But I, I never uh, analogized it. It's actually a very, very interesting analogy. Analogized it with any of the great uh, civil rights movements uh, in the country. There may be, for, for those who believe that the government has been draconian here, as do I, there may be some glimmers uh, of hope uh, with respect to the legalization uh, of the use of, uh, of uh, recreational or medicinal uh, drugs that the government uh, has uh, in a Victorian, draconian, thoughtless, expensive, bloody way attempted uh, to keep away from us. I see progress uh, in that direction. It's very difficult very difficult to send someone to jail because of what they put in their body because they became addicted to it when there was no other crime. It's a, in my view, again, we talk about natural law versus positivism. There are two kinds of laws. There's malum in se and malum prohibitum. Malum in se are laws that prohibit behavior because it is wrongful in and of itself, like murder or theft or rape. Malum prohibitum are the class of laws that prohibit things that the government wants prohibited, irrespective of whether it's inherently wrong, like gambling or prostitution or drugs. The fewer malum prohibitum laws we have, the more human freedom we can express and enjoy. Okay, we have a question right here. And then take the, take the mic all the way to the back for the next question. Emilio Adolfo Rivero, New Cuba Coalition. I would like to hear the comments uh, of the panel and of you, Mr. Bowles, on some doubts I have. First doubt is, aren't we applying our values? Use your mic. Thank you. Aren't we applying our values of today to what our ancestors did 200 years ago? That's one. And another doubt I have is this. 
Mr. Root, Your Honor, you didn't mention that during the times that the blacks were slaves in the United States, there were more white slaves in the United States than blacks. And not they were servants subject to indenture. Indenture. Um, indenture. No. They would call themselves slaves. Society called themselves them slaves. Now, another thing. Racism and slavery could be equated, but not always. It's a question of circumstances. More white people were taken from Europe to Africa as slaves than the reverse. Especially okay. Blonde. Okay, that's three questions. That's enough. Okay, no, no, Judge? No, just a second, just a second. Well, very quickly. Okay. No, I'm, I'm asking their, their opinion. We find contradictions between our laws of today and the same laws how they were applied, the Constitution, the laws they were applied uh, uh, two centuries ago. Could you please, uh, and I think this is a question that you don't consider the values. Could you please? Thank you, sir. Well, the, the, the book is not an encyclopedia, and, and it, it doesn't purport to address uh, all slavery or, or all evils uh, inflicted in the name of the Constitution. Uh, it, it addresses the plight of African Americans uh, and what the government did to them. And yes, of course, I have 21st century values, even though my values are animated by people like Augustine and Aquinas and, and John Locke and, and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, this is actually your argument one of the classic defenses uh, of Abraham Lincoln. Oh, well, he just shared the white racist views of everybody else that was white and in the government uh, in those days. That doesn't justify those views, at, didn't justify them at the time, and it doesn't justify uh, our observation or failure to condemn them uh, from, from the vantage point of history. Well, you know, when you write a book, you, you have a limitation of space and time. Uh, you also have publishers who make uh, demands on you. I don't apologize for not putting anything uh, in the book, and I see that you're very animated by it, but this is not a book about white slavery. It's a book about African-American treatment at the hands of white governments and how racism permeated that treatment. Uh, Another book could be written on the issues that you so passionately raise. Jason, you. Uh, yeah, are, are we are we applying our values to what our ancestors did? Uh, yes. Uh, what other values should we apply? Uh, historians get asked this question about values all the time, and it's one they ask themselves all the time. Uh, but this does not have to necessarily mean that all history is. Uh, purely a statement of values. There is such a thing as uh, uh, treating the facts objectively, weighing evidence fairly, despite having personal beliefs or values uh, in a greater or more, more philosophical sense. Uh, there, there is a danger of a conflict there. There is not a necessity of a conflict. It is possible to write a judicious history uh, that nonetheless uh, does speak to the author's own values. That is certainly possible. And uh, why is this a particularly important topic uh, as opposed to, say, whites who were taken into slavery? Because slavery and subsequent racism and its after effects are a uh, much more, more important part of the African-American story than they are of the white story. Uh, the, the experience of whites taken into slavery in the United States is, is a curiosity. It's not a universal reality for white people. And so that, there, is, there is a real story there that people uh, are likely to identify with. And to some extent, uh, we can still see the effects of racism around us, although in a much attenuated sense now. And, and so it does remain historically important. And it remains important for understanding America as it exists today in a way that, for example, the experience of whites taken into slavery uh, doesn't really uh, have the same salience. Damon, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, 
press it down? It's on. Okay. Um, I would just say that there were opponents of slavery at the time. So it's, it's not simply a question of our values today. Uh, there were founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, Governor Morris, opposed slavery. Um, Frederick Douglass was a slave, was born into slavery, and escaped and said, you have no right to own me. You, uh, he wrote this famous letter to his master, Thomas Old. So there are contemporaries. It's not simply a matter of everyone at the time thought slavery was great. Um, Lots of lots of people opposed it, and so I think historically we can we can look at their words and draw on them also. So it's I I, I mean I agree with Jason that of course, you know we apply our values when we're looking at history and we're talking about these stories. But um, there were opponents of slavery at the time and on uh, for what we're talking about. So, well, and since nobody else has been too blunt about it, let me just say that I don't think that the factual claims made by the questioner are accurate. But uh, he's provided me with a research paper here, so I'll certainly take a look at it. Um, okay, I, I called on the person in the back, and then please take the microphone here. Thank you. You can give him the mic. He won't shout until the other guy's finished. <laughs> Following the two recent uh, hate murders, one of an abortion doctor and the other of a guard at the uh, Holocaust Museum, there were nearly identical remarks made by uh, backers of their of, of organizations such as those to which they were with which they were affiliated. The one was, we don't approve of what he did because it makes us look bad. And the other one was, we don't approve of what he did because it's bad for our image. And I bring these points up because these are folks who advocate views touching on the issues you raised. And by pointing out that the government has been the perpetrator of all this racism, for example, and that it's been upheld in opposition to natural law, isn't there the danger that if people act based upon natural law and the government doesn't enforce written law to prevent that, that we'll see popular will natural law interpreted through popular will in a way to lead in a way that leads to more and not less racism well the natural is this for me to answer yeah the, the, the natural law is a is a frustration of popular will and the natural law would condemn dr uh, tiller's uh, slaughter of 60,000 babies with the same efficient and passionate zeal with which it would condemn the guy who killed, I don't even know his name, Dr. Tiller uh, in the church. But the natural law would also condemn a government that allowed Dr. Tiller to do what he did. Now, I uh, concede that the natural law, any theory taken to extremes can have radical and unpleasant uh, effects. And quite frankly, judges who enforced the natural law to the frustration of the majority with regularity and consistency might find themselves facing impeachment trials uh, because there must generally be public sentiment uh, for uh, great sea changes in our thinking. Uh, I answered, I don't remember which one of you put the question to me. I, um, I think it was Jason, about how I would have ruled had Susan B. Anthony come to me. I would have taken my career into my hands by having uh, set, struck down the law that prohibited women from voting, but it was clearly unnatural, wrong by any standard, and ought to have been, uh, ought to have been wiped away. But yes, you, could take, you can take any theory. I mean, you could take any religion, and if you don't temper it with reason, it becomes fanatical. So if, uh, if you think that you're saving lives by killing the abortionist, you're violating another natural law command, which is that you may not do evil, that good may come of it. And taking someone's life is always, except in the instance of self-defense, evil. Professor Bernstein. Yeah, David. In, over here. 
David Bernstein, George Mason Law School. Uh, I've had the chance to, uh, to at least glance at your book. It looks very interesting, so congratulations. Uh, obviously, like you said, your book is an encyclopedia and can't cover everything, but one thing I didn't at least notice uh, when, I, when, I, when I was able to take a quick look at the book was uh, the fact that African-American leadership from Frederick Douglass uh, uh, through Booker T. Washington through the 1930s was basically uh, in favor of limited government, uh, hostile uh, and s skeptical of labor unions and certainly of any legislation that gave labor unions any special power, and generally individualist, uh, and not, if not quite libertarian, at least classical liberal in nature. By the 1930s, though, there was partly an ideological conversion, but I think uh, far-sighted African-American leaders saw that in the new era of big government, having this philosophy and this attitude of individual rights wasn't going to get them anywhere. And they actually used the labor movement as a model. And just like the labor movement was able to get the Wagner Act and other special group privileges uh, through the federal government, uh, African-American leaders say, if we organize ourselves that way, that's the way in the interest group state that we get ahead. And, that's, and they were right. I, I think they would have been quite mistaken uh, on behalf of their constituents to uh, hear classical liberalism in the New Deal welfare state. State. So the question is: A lot of conservative other commentators say that uh, Africa. You know, we need to not let the government uh, look at race, and we need to get beyond race, and so forth and so on. But from the perspective of African American leaders, and Jennifer Morris, who was mentioned by Dr. Kuznicki, I heard her once say this at Cato: uh, If the farmers are organizing to get farm stuff. Uh, farm, you know, uh, farm subsidies, and the elderly organized to get Medicare and Social Security, and the defense contractors organized, and there are how many thousands of lobbying groups from the, in the United States? Why should African Americans, who are still some of surrogate society and who are sort of a distinct class, be the first ones to disarm and decide, oh, we just want individual rights, and we don't want groups, you know, right, any kind of privileges as a class, but let everyone else get them? So, how do we make an argument, or should we make an argument, that the government shouldn't take into account? race when they do take into account every other kind of possible lobbying group that there is? Well, because race is an immutable characteristic of birth. I mean, for the same reason that the government shouldn't discriminate against women or gays or anybody else that uh, uh, experiences an immutable characteristic of birth, the government that, that is removed from the government's armament. The government can say this particular organization and, and, and lobbying group is uh, is not something I want to uh, that, that I find appealing. Whether it's to use your example, uh, farmers or uh, or defense contractors, those are policy judgments that the government makes. But the government can't say, "I'm going to reject the plea of these people because they're black or they're or they're gay uh, or they're female," uh, because they're they're characteristics that are part of one's uh, humanity and which the government must uh, recognize and can't use as a, as a stumbling block, as a sword, uh, or as a shield. Uh, there are many aspects of the history uh, of uh, African American, the, the, the slow, torturous march toward freedom, which are not covered in the book. R remember my own bias is that of a lawyer and that of a, of a former judge. So I l write the book through that uh, prism. But there are great stories, and both of my uh, commentators here today alluded to them, as did you, Professor, of strong, deep uh, libertarian thinking uh, amongst African-American leadership before Thurgood Marshall and those folks uh, came along and started to score uh, victories in the courts. Judge, um, I'm a criminal defense attorney from um, one of the most segregated cities in the nation, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We uh, make the news several <laughs> times a month. Um, and I'm also working on my PhD in anthropology, so I look at things from a slightly different um, angle. And um, I think there's a question in here somewhere, but judges make me nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. By looking at you is making you nervous? <laughs> Your authority and knowledge. Um, but basically. <laughs> I need to get over that as a lawyer. <laughs> Basically, um, it's been almost 400 years, and a quote from St. Thomas More's um, Utopia comes to mind in that, and also as an anthropologist, um, I think the Constitution is a beautiful thing, but the kids I represent, I see none of them from the get-go stand a chance, and I think of that quote about um, the law not being just or practical when you have a population of people 
in one culture dominated by the rules and the constitution from another, um, where can it really be applied equally when there's a economic environmental environment going on that's so prohibitive to access? I, I don't. I, I don't know how judges in Wisconsin become judges. I'm going to guess since 37 states elect them, and that since uh, Wisconsin came into being uh, uh, at the behest of progressives, uh, the judges are elected. And in my view, that's wrong. I come from a system where judges are appointed. I had a lifetime appointment. There are only three states where the state judges get lifetime appointments. Interestingly, three of the most liberal states in the union, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Jersey, Federal Article Three judges, not bankruptcy judges or administrative law judges, but the judges whose decisions you read and who bind and restrain the other uh, two branches of the government are life tenure judges, so they can be immune from that. I mean, judges must bend over backwards and strain at a gnat in order to remove all vestige of racism, not only from their own thinking, but, but from what's happening uh, in the courtroom. So much so that it's better that the uh, guilty be set free, uh, but that innocent be punished or that racism animate uh, law enforcement. And it should come as a surprise to no one in this room. R racism truly animates law enforcement more than any other aspect of the government with which I've had any personal uh, involvement. And uh, judges must be uh, scrupulous, and painstaking to prevent that from happening. I know it's difficult, uh, but they, they must endeavor mightily for that. Other, otherwise, they're violating their oath to uphold the core American values of freedom and equality.